Sex trafficking in the US. In popular imagination, women are forced across borders and held against their will. They all have the same notion that sex trafficking looks like the movie Taken. But a new picture is emerging. One of women born and raised American. Losing my mother was kind of like where things took a turn for the worst. We're heading for a safe house that cares for child victims of sex trafficking. These kids that are being identified at age 12 and 13 and 14 desperately need help now. You okay? Roaming streets, sold online, out of hotels, out of houses. I was 15 when I was out here. Rosie was 15 when she was out here. Many are enslaved through drugs and branded as property. He decided to put two devils having sex on my back. Thought it would be funny, thought it would be cute. Traditional views of prostitution are being challenged here in Ohio. I believe that prostitution is the most misunderstood criminal enterprise in America right now. Put her on the right path. Their treatment of victims is cutting edge. It's succeeding. I'm happy I'm here, but not here. They're redefining what sex trafficking really is and how to escape it. I feel like I'm taking my body back. We follow three survivors in Columbus, Ohio. Oh my gosh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Ah, no, oh, son of a butthead, oh. I can't believe this is getting covered up right now. I never in my life thought that this was going to be able to happen. Closing a life chapter. Under these outlines of flowers is an old tattoo, the name of an ex-boyfriend that was her sugar daddy. When I was like 19 years old, I got into a relationship with this guy. Um, we lived two completely different lifestyles. I wasn't in love with him. He gave me what I wanted as long as I did what he wanted. So the tattoo was just like a sign of loyalty to him, property, reassurance, you know, because it's permanent, it's forever. It was a mark of things to come. Her hand, tattooed with a rose, hides a branding from a family of sex traffickers. The branding on my hand is a Spanish word, it's punta, and it can mean three different things in Spanish, which is ho, whore, or the B word. Every morning when I would wake up, there would be somebody else in the bed with me, and uh, I couldn't tell you what happened the night before. I still don't even know. Every single family member had did whatever they wanted to do. Um, like I said, because I would get so drunk, I would black out. But that was another way of me trying to escape reality, escape my feelings, escape the life that I was living, just being in survival mode. It was always about survival mode. Well, you got to completely rebuild yourself up. To love yourself is one of the hardest things to do because for your biggest resentment is towards yourself and your hardest person to forgive is yourself. Um, so when you conquer that and you overcome that, little things like that tattoo, that memory will fade away. stepdad was an alcoholic and uh, kind of grew up in like a violent home. My mother had a lot of health problems and she was prescribed a lot of pain medication. I woke up getting ready for school one day and um, found her dead and uh, she had shot herself due to this disease. She was going through withdrawals um, and she took her own life because of it. I was mad at the world, mad at everyone. Um, my, losing my mother was kind of like where things took a turn for the worst and I started seeking out other ways and, and that's when using drugs, you know, I started experimenting with marijuana and ecstasy um, really young. I remember one of my boyfriends, he sold drugs and um, I started using pain pills and uh, I still didn't even realize that I was going down like the same path as my mother, um, being addicted to pain medication. By the age of 19, I was using heroin and uh, I didn't know nothing, know what it was about. I just knew I loved the way that I felt when I did it. And uh, the men that I always, you know, it was abusive relationships, that became my norm. Um, I grew up watching my mother, you know, get beat. And, and um, I always said I would never let a man put his hands on me, but it didn't matter. He could, 
he could beat me till my face turned blue, but if he told me he was sorry and he told me that he loved me, I fed off of that more. Before I even met a pimp, the sex trafficking was already happening because people have this image of like this man in a suit selling these women, um, like what you see on TVs and that's not the case. Really it's happening in your backyard. Um, it could be a family member, it can be a boyfriend living in Nebraska um, and continuing to hang around that family. It's not like they held my hand down to do that, but um, I felt like I belonged and like I was somebody. And, and at the time I had no self-worth or self-love for myself, so that was okay. Like old fashioned slave owners, many traffickers brand their women. They force their victims into getting tattoos to prove their loyalty. It's what inspired Survivors Inc., a charity set up by Jennifer Kempton, herself a survivor of sex trafficking. Tattooist Mike Prickett covers up brandings, as well as other physical reminders of trafficking, like scars and burns, at no cost to the women. Jennifer died two years ago, but Mike continues the work they began four years ago. So when you got started, how often were you doing cover-ups for these women? Uh, at least once a week. That's been kind of eye-opening. Human trafficking was one of those things that was never really on my radar. It was something that you saw on the news that happened in other countries, hmm. not in your backyard. Um, so kind of recognizing that was a little bit rougher than what I had anticipated, thinking, you know, I have sisters, I have a daughter, I have a strong wife, like it could have been any of them at some time, you know. Have you noticed any trends in the past four years with the types of brandings that are getting covered? Probably the last like year and a half, two years, things have been a lot bigger. When I first started, they were maybe softball size. Now I get more stuff like this that takes two to four or five sessions than just one quick one. That's it. You're a champ. That was a lot of lines. It'll take a few more sessions before this cover-up is coloured and completed. But the outlines are done. <laughs> that looks so good, thank you. You can't even see it. Oh my god. appreciate you. Oh, no problem. I'm glad that you got it done. <sighs> Most people believe sex trafficking victims are brought into the United States from places like South America or Asia. And while that does happen, it's fairly uncommon. The Department of Justice says over 80% of victims are actually born and raised right here in the US. And Ohio is one of the worst states for sex trafficking. Columbus sits in the middle of the US at the center of a busy intersection of highways that link the north and south, east and west. But many women are simply trafficked from within their own neighborhoods. We're heading for a safe house that cares for child victims of sex trafficking. And apparently they're seeing a growing demand for beds and have given us rare access to see exactly why more and more girls are caught up in this crisis. This is Grace Haven. When we arrive, the girls are doing an online course in a small classroom. On top of their studies, these girls take part in therapy sessions, do fun activities and go on field trips, anything to give girls back their childhoods. So we can't identify the exterior of this place or the girls that occupy it, so I'm going to give you a little tour. Here we've got games, two shelves of it. There are colouring in books. I guess it kind of gives you a sense of just how young these girls are. And then here we've got the living room space. Um, moving into the bedroom. This bedroom looks like any girl's bedroom. This could be my bedroom. Lots of self-affirmations on the wall. What I find quite shocking is that there's a picture of an ultrasound on the board. So there's a girl in here that's expecting. 
Some of the girls here are as young as 12, and they're usually here for eight months until authorities find them a new home. I'm meeting with Scott Arnold, who runs the centre. Yes, we like it here. It feels like a real home. <laughs> That's, that is part of what we're after. We're trying to create a, a, as much as we can, not an institutional place. Most of the young people that come to us, well, really all, come either through a local county court or a children's services agency. Can you tell me a bit about the trend, about whether this is a growing problem? The need, I think, is growing in dramatic ways, in part because we're rethinking what it means to be a sex trafficked young person. Around 3,000 underage girls are at risk of being trafficked each year in Ohio. Resources are stretched. Here at full capacity there are eight girls. They're planning on tripling that number, but even that may not be enough. How do these children get trafficked in the first place? It can be a, a mom who frequently can be drug addicted and needs some resources financially to pay for her drug addiction. It can also be moms who bring um, a man into their home, whether it's the father or more often than not a boyfriend, who begins to molest the child and then things go from there. Another typical path would be a young person who is um, in relational strain with their family. And so that kid is at risk to an older man that shows up in her life and begins to act and behave like he's romantically interested and then other men start being brought in and the pressure starts being put on the girl, well, I've done all these things for you and I love you, why won't you do this for me? And, and then there's another subset that I would say and that is uh, runaway kids. They'll stop and roll down the window, do you have a place to live, are you okay, can I buy you a meal? And uh, so they're preyed on aggressively. These kids that are being identified at age 12 and 13 and 14 um, desperately need help now. Nearly every prostitute that we see was a child once that was trafficked against her will and manipulated into a life and then has felt trapped and doesn't find an off-ramp to that life frequently until their life is completely destroyed. That is what prostitution is. And the start of that is what human trafficking is. When you see it that way, suddenly you're horrified at a whole new level. Holly is a survivor of sex trafficking. She's showing us her local neighborhood with her younger sister, Rosie. I moved to Columbus when I was 15 to live with my real mother, which is like one of the worst decisions of my life because within, a, within two weeks of being here in Columbus with my real mother, we were using drugs together. Within a month of being here in Columbus, we were prostituting together. Holly reclaimed her life four years ago and is living near the same streets that held her captive for 17 years. And this is this where is, you grew up? Yeah, this is my stepdad's house. Okay. Well, I guess I wouldn't, I mean, I guess he's my stepdad, like, because he was there for, like, most of it, but, like, he was my mom's sugar daddy. I don't know if you know what that term is, but, like, an older man that takes care of you. Mm, yeah. And, like, that's, this is where she brought us to. Right. Yeah. And how many, who, who lived here then at the time? Um, so. At the time it was me, it was her, it was him, it mm -hmm. was his two sons. Mm -hmm. um, just a lot of chaos and dysfunction. Yes. Yeah. How long were you here? He was for? a trick too, of ours. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, I think he had sex with all of us. Mm -hmm. Me, my sister, I used my to other have sister. sex with him, like every month around the first of the month when he'd get his check. God, I can't, I can't imagine. I used to be angry, but I'm not so angry anymore. Like, it doesn't serve a purpose. It just keeps me, like, bound up inside. So, like, you kind of just forgive and, and move forward with your life. Have you ever considered, like, reporting them or...? I don't think that would do any justice. Like, I don't know. He's, like, in his 80s. He's, like, on his deathbed. Rosie was led down a similar path of drugs and abuse. The only time I would see my sister is when I would come out on outreach. So that first time I stopped, I didn't know it was her. I just had said, hey, there's a girl sleeping in a little cubby hole. Can we stop? And as we got closer and she stood up and I was like, hey, would you like a hygiene bag and a lunch? She got up and she approached. And I was like, oh, my God, that's my sister. And like tears just started flowing. Like I was so devastated. Like I hadn't seen her in a year and a half. And I felt like I had caused this because like I, you know, my mother brought me into the lifestyle. I was in the lifestyle and like I probably made it look really gr glamorous and I brought her into the lifestyle and I brought her into her own living hell. 
For more than a year, Holly visited Rosie every week until she escaped into recovery. Looking at that spot now and, and where you were at, how does that make you feel? I felt alone, I felt trapped, and I honestly thought that I wasn't gonna make it out the lifestyle. I thought that I was gonna die out here on these streets. My mother um, gave birth to me when she was 16 years old. She gave me to my grandparents who were also alcoholic and smoked marijuana. I can remember being verbally and physically abused by my grandparents, sexually abused by other members of my family, all before the age of five. I remember being called like a hooker, a whore, things like that, saying I was worthless and just like my mother, before I even knew what any of these things meant. I excelled in school. It was an escape from my reality. Um, I remember being in the first grade and the teacher had the same last name as me and I used to pretend she was my mother because I longed for a relationship with my mother. I would only get remnants of her. My birthday is Christmas Day, so I'm sitting by the window waiting because she promised me she was coming on Christmas Day to see me with presents. And I remember staring out of the window and she never showed up. At about age 12, I was allowed to smoke marijuana in the home. About age 15, I was in a group home. I got in trouble at the group home, and I decided I was gonna come up here and live with my real mother. Within two weeks of being here in Columbus, I'm smoking crack cocaine with my mother, and within a month of being here, I'm prostituting with my mother. I was vulnerable, I was exposed. My mother was benefiting from my e exploitation. So there was this guy who kept saying, like, come join my team. It looked glamorous, like, the rap industry depicts like this god. It looked like he took care of them, like they all had nice clothes, a place to stay, and um, I entered into hell. He used to have this saying like, you signed on the dotted line, you owe me your life. And I thought it was cute or funny or just a joke, but he meant it. I remember walking into another um, drug house and spending $20 there and like, him finding out and him beating me up. Like they beat me with a crock pot lid until it broke over my head. And then he told me to go upstairs and take a shower and get cleaned up and go get some money. And that's exactly what I did because I feared for my life. He would take me to the brink of thinking he was going to kill me. And then he would make it all better with drugs or affection or telling me he was sorry. By the time I was 17 or 18, I had been raped more times than I can count. I had been kidnapped, I had been held hostage. Um, I've had, I've been stabbed, I've been shot at. I just wanted to be normal, like I wanted to be a nurse. I wanted a life, I wanted a family. And I felt that was stolen from me at a very young age. I didn't have that opportunity. I had like this trauma bond to him. Like I felt like he took care of me, even though like he would beat me and then I'd go upstairs and go to sleep and I'd wake up to him raping me. Um, like I felt attached to him because I felt like he cared for me. The, the one guy like marked most of his girls with either royalty is loyalty or love is loyalty. There was a surplus of women under one house. Sometimes as many as 20 would be working for one pimp. Um, it's not uncommon for most of us to bear some sort of branding from his signia, like whether it be for his gang or whatever he wants like to put his name on you or some type of something. Everybody knows like you're his bitch. Um, he ended up going to prison for federal drug trafficking. I ended up going to prison for drug possession because I was his mule. So I started attending this group and I never identified as a human trafficking victim. And like all these things that these abusers and traffickers are doing to their, their victims, I identified. Like I, the, it was like a light clicked on for me and the fog was removed from my eyes and I was able to make a choice. I was able to choose to live and not allow this to happen to me and I empowered myself. Sex trafficking survivors are often dismissed as criminals, addicts and the homeless. Bigger still, prostitution is often seen as a life choice, but here in Columbus, those perceptions are slowly changing. We're here at the Franklin County Court where they've spearheaded a new program which helps victims of sex trafficking get back on the road to recovery. Roxanne! 
Hi, Roxanne. Hi, guys. Hi. It's good to see Hi. you. I know a lot of you. Yeah. We're happy you're here. Yeah. Um, I'm not. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy I'm here, but not here. Right. They get that. Let me tell you how special you are, right? I'm so proud of you for making your way here and saying, hey, I'm ready. You know? I mean, I'm just loving that right now. This is Catch Court, a program that takes in women who have been jailed for prostitution or crimes committed for their trafficker. It then redefines them as victims and offers them a path to recovery. Get some clean time under your belt. Catch stands for changing actions to change habits. Melissa comes here and it's where Holly got her life back. Now it's her sister Rosie's turn. It's two years of intensive probation with a sober home, addiction treatment and trauma therapy. Women must come here each week to check in. It's the brainchild of Judge Paul Herbert. I was in arraignment court, which is a court where everyone who's in jail and we set bonds on them. Mm -hmm. And they changed the law in domestic violence to where I had to see and hear every domestic violence case. I didn't like it at all because I was had to hear all these horrible things. But I see these victims kind of lost, scared, and the betrayal. So this was going on. And the sheriff brought the next defendant out on the wall. And I looked up and it was a woman. And she looked exactly like one of these victims of domestic violence. I'm like, why, why would I get that feel? You know, it's a, it's a, a prisoner. It's a defendant. She's standing there in handcuffs, but she had that same look about her and the same similar injuries. Mm -hmm. And I looked down at the file and it said prostitute. And I thought, how could a prostitute ever look like a domestic violence victim? I mean, now I look back and think that's dumb. And I found out some staggering statistics that the world has hidden from us. Of over a thousand women arrested for prostitution in Columbus, Judge Herbert found 900 of them were trafficking victims. What do we have here? We have a new case yes. of obstructing, yes. a heinous obstructing official business. Yes. And then you're on probation, is it, for this other case? Yes. And so what you're basically saying is you want me to be your judge now. Yes. Is that true? Yes. But you don't know me very well, do you? Yes, I do. Okay. From a long, long time ago. What's my nickname? I don't know your nickname. Hang <laughs> <laughs> him high, Herbert. I believe that prostitution is the most misunderstood criminal enterprise in America right now. It's supposed to be the world's oldest profession. Mm -hmm. So I believe that it's really the world's oldest oppression of women and girls and other vulnerable populations. You don't need chains <laughs> like the movies. You're giving them a mm -hmm. cell phone, you know where they are, you know, you, you're controlling their every movement. You mix in uh, physical and sexual violence. It's like prisoner of war tactics. Funds for catch are limited, so before they can be accepted, women must show their willingness to change. Why don't you tell me, like, why you want to be in the catch court, if you don't mind? Well, because, um, first off, my sister Kim told me how great it was. I was coming with Safe Harbor House. Over in Springfield? Yes. And that's where I got all my clean time. Uh, at, well, that's how I got the start of my clean time and my new life and I just want to get back to that again. And uh, guess what, I'm going to accept you in the catch court. This by all means is an unconventional court, allowing women to empower and support one another. I have the gavel and the robe and I get court started and I do the legal things, but then I sort of step back and let the women heal each other, help heal each other. Tell her, like, what's the secret to success there? Put her on the right path, okay? So I think you'll be seeing her soon, so like, help her out. Um, it's a pretty structured environment, but for a lot of us, that's what we need. For real, we don't have to worry about food, we don't have to worry about a place to lay. We have a really nice house, it's beautiful. Um, you know, we, we have an area out back with tables and swings, and it's, it's really a nice place, and they really care about you. And we love you. <laughs> you're going to get mad, and you're going to want to leave. And all I can say is any of us at any given time are here for you. Absolutely. Because 
since you signed those papers, you are now officially our sister. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we are going to love you until you absolutely love yourself. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Coming into the catch court has allowed me to open up, trust the judge, trust catch staff, you know what I mean? Because that misconception that they're out to get me, or if I mess up, if I'm not perfect, that I'm going to go to jail. I remember what it felt like to leave and go back out there on the streets and go back to that old stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, I got to get out of this. I got to get back to this program. I'm going to be your official welcome committee. <laughs> and I'm going to welcome she you will. so good. By the time the handcuffs come off, we're hoping that she looks forward to coming to court and being part of that camaraderie and that squad. Strict rules apply with no contact with people who are a bad influence and so they're placed in a sober home away from their trafficker. I have almost eight months clean. Treatment for drug use and trauma is rigorous. A woman is using drugs to medicate her trauma. Once you settle that trauma down, their drug, they don't want to use drugs anymore. The trauma is at the root of their drug addiction rather than their drug addiction is driving everything. Nice to see you. I'll be seeing you all soon, I hope. Roxanne will also be offered a job. Catch teams up with a catering company which only employs survivors of sex trafficking. It's very difficult for women with a criminal record to find a job, so this scheme will play a key part in Roxanne's rehabilitation. For any brandings on her body, she can access Survivors Inc. and now a clinic that completely removes tattoos. This woman put it to the test. In two months I'll have to go back and they'll just get what they miss. But it's really simple and it's not very painful. I'm 50 years old and I'm trying to present myself in a different way now. Mm -hmm. And it was a struggle for me, you know, like I have this big ugly reminder of my past, but then do I just get a bigger tattoo to mm -hmm. cover it up, you know? <coughs> So I was really grateful for the opportunity to be able to do this. So I could just erase my past and I don't have to worry about it. Barb, that is like deep stuff, girl. There's proof the program is working. While the national average of recommitting crimes is 80%, catch court's rate is less than 30%, saving state money and, more importantly, saving lives. Slowly, other states like Indiana and Illinois are taking notice. Judge Herbert's model has also been adopted by three other cities in Ohio. For a taster of the situation on the ground, I'm joining Holly and her volunteers. They've been handing out care packages to possible sex trafficking victims for the past four years. How many boxes have you got here We've then? Got four boxes. We've got like okay. 19 bags, um, probably like 20 plus lunches. Could you give me a sense of like what we've got in these sure, we can care open packages? Them up. Um, a little snack, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, mm. some fresh carrots. Um, let's see what else is in here. Ooh, nice, a Cheryl's cookie. Then we have our hygiene bags. Toothbrush, toothpaste, um, hand cream. Condoms, those are a big necessity. Sometimes these are the most expensive thing on the item list. Right. Um, deodorant, comb, feminine hygiene products. Mm -hmm. We've been pretty successful in people supporting us because mm -hmm. we haven't missed a Sunday in almost four years. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Every Sunday. Every Sunday, no matter what, six o'clock, we're out. And I see you're joined by a sister now as well. Absolutely. Yeah. We're matching today. Like, yeah, we're, you are. We're, we're I love the outfits. Today. Yeah, we you really both look beautiful. Yeah. Let's do it. So tell me about the area that we're going around today then. Um, a lot of the houses are like depleted homes. I would say you would find a drug house on every corner, if not two or three on every corner. Wow. Um, brothels or houses where women are trafficked out of. Hey, would you like a hygiene bag and a lunch? It's kind of hot out here today, right? Yes. There's a water in there and, this, and some snacks and stuff. Be safe, okay? No Over problem. the years, the group has seen an increase in women out here there could be any number of reasons for that. What is known is that the closure of motels linked to sex trafficking has moved the problem elsewhere. On top of that, the Columbus Vice Unit in charge of prostitution is being reorganised. It disbanded earlier this year after an officer was found blackmailing women for sex. All this means is that there are fewer cops on the streets dealing with the problem. Friend, how are you? Here's lunches. Huh? Will you hand one to her? One of those are for her. And then, oh, you want the little notebook one? 
Ooh, this has got some Bath and Body Works stuff in there. How are you doing? I miss you. I, I have lost a lot of weight. Be safe. I love you. Bye, guys. She's been through a lot. She's transgender as well. So if she's picked up and somebody realizes this, they, she's, she's raped her, beat her, thrown her out somewhere far away. I have a soft spot in my heart for her because we were out here together for quite some time mm -hmm. and we helped each other like through our tough times like we cried with each other we've showered with each other like mm -hmm. like her trying to hurry and get ready like so we can get out in time it's just we've been through a lot together um how does it feel for you to have recovered and you know still see her out here it's really hard to walk away yeah. Like, I wish I could put her in the car and take her with me, but I know that that's not realistic right now, not until she's ready, not until something changes for her. This is but a snapshot of how women are sold. Now it's all online. Last year, the FBI shut down Backpage.com, which became a notorious marketplace for sex trafficking. But the problem just moves elsewhere. You can find the women on escort services, social media, and even in the newspaper's local classifieds. You want a hygiene bag and lunch? I haven't seen you in a long time. We saw several women wandering up and down these streets, okay. looking heavily sedated by drugs. She's probably been up for a few days without without sleep, maybe like two or three, and that's why she's moving around like that. Okay. She's probably on crack and heroin. Did you see? I seen track marks on her arm. Beyond these impoverished areas, trafficking still happens, but it looks different. Women are usually kept indoors. Hotels and casinos are magnets for activity, especially during major sports events. Friend, I seen you and I, you know I have to come back. I love you, friend. How are you? Hey, you look yeah, beautiful. Hey, You're beautiful. Look, you. look who's in the back. Hi, Rosie. Check that out, right? Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? Please, you, you look tired, friend. You tired? Yeah. Please be careful. I, know. I love you. I know. Be safe. I love you. She's Isn't she? She's always so happy. But like, yeah. even even in hard times, you got to keep a smile on your face, you know? How long have you known her for? Oh God, 10 years. Really? Oh yeah, a long time. It's really hard to walk away. Not just her, a lot of them. Like, because I know what it's like to, to be desolate. I know what it's like to feel hopeless. I was surprised to see how many women were out here. It seemed disproportionate to Columbus's relatively small population, a fewer than 900,000 people. But what was more surprising was how young many of them looked. I did have lunches, but I ran out of lunches. Oh, I love your little star, you're beautiful. That girl was maybe like 16 or 17. She didn't look very old. Just teenagers. When these girls are brought in, what would you say is the average amount of time in terms of months or years that they're kept in that life? Sometimes it doesn't end. Sometimes you die out here. Sex trafficking is the most common form of human trafficking and it's highly lucrative. Worldwide, it pulls in $100 billion a year and ensnares 4.8 million people. But what makes a trafficker and what draws them to an industry that exploits and creates further suffering? We've come to an Ohio prison to find out. Jeffrey Bagley uh, has been sentenced to 10 years. He ran a really prolific sex trafficking ring. So it'd be really fascinating to see what he has to say and why he's agreed to do this interview. After a 17-month investigation, Jeffrey Bagley was convicted in April 2019 alongside another man, Curtis Gossett. They trafficked dozens of women using drugs to control them. I worked for Curtis, Curtis Construction Company, and was uh, just getting paid in drugs with a free house to live in, you know. And then um, that's when he came to me and asked me if I wanted to change jobs. And I was like, yeah, what do I got to do? And all I had to do was just drive a female to out calls, to hotels or, or whatever, and make sure she was safe. And then um, that's pretty much when it all started. It was easy for the men to recruit the women almost directly from jail. 
There's a magazine that comes out you can buy at the corner stores that has people go to jail for that week and what their charges are. And if any of them were soliciting, you know, we, we would send them to the jail and they'd talk to them and ask them if they wanted to come work for us and we would bond them out. So that's where the recruiting from the jails came in at. So how much money were these women making you? Each girl would be like anywhere from 1000 to 1500 a day, each, each girl. Wow. And how many clients would they be seeing on average every day? Uh, well, in the beginning, when I was there driving some of them to their calls, uh, we had a couple girls that would see three or four a day. So in what range then? So from three or four to? Uh, Twelve. Within about a year, it got, it got really big where we, we had seen almost uh, about three quarters of a million dollars, like quick. In 2017, I made 450000 myself. I would never make that anywhere else. But you're dealing with humans. You're not dealing right. with just money coming in and out. I mean, that could have been your daughter. You sound, make it sound so transactional, which I, you know, I'm a little like, astounded by, I guess. Do you understand that kind of reaction that I have? I, I kind of, I mean, but that's just how it was for so long. It was just, it was just normal. We, like, that was just normal. Were you sorry that you got caught, or you, were you sorry for what happened? I mean, yeah, I'm sorry I got caught, you know, because, uh, man, my kids was being taken care of very, very well, you know. Now I'm in here, and it's over. I can't do nothing now at all. You know, they get $4.50 a month now. That's it. Do you have any remorse for what you did to the women? Yeah, I didn't know, but because... Uh, I was, you know, pretty much in the same boat they was in, you know. I was getting high just like they were, you know, and I did for the drugs just like they did because they wouldn't be, you know, selling themselves if they wasn't, you know, on drugs themselves. So, I mean, I don't know, really, you know, I haven't really thought about that. Jen is getting her right leg inked. It's the last visible reminder of her troubled past. Under what will be a colorful lighthouse are scars from nearly losing her leg to drug use while being trafficked. Uh, the first one I was with, I was with for a few months. He got 200 years because he was doing it to other girls in a few different states. Jen had several brandings across her body. The worst was on her back. I've seen a lot of stuff, but I've never had an existing tattoo make my heart sink. And that one did it. You ready? Yep. All right, this is one of those long lines, okay? Okay. Oh my gosh. One, two, three, four, five. To make more money, I guess, he decided to put two devils having sex on my back. Thought it would be funny, thought it would be cute. So I had devils on each shoulder. I had a boy devil, a girl devil. When I got with my son's father, that's really when everything changed. My whole life changed. Um, Larry was actually six months younger than my dad. I mean, I just remember my son crying, and I'm crying, and his brother had some, some Percocets. And he's like, here, you know, just, just take one. Like, it'll help you with your ears. It was something I never felt before. It was, gave me energy, like I was super mom. I could take care of my kid. Larry had tried heroin before. Um, he told me it was the exact same thing, a little stronger, but it was half the price. So I thought, why not? Um, my addiction got so bad to where one day um, we didn't have money. 
and Larry knew um, of the guys around the corner. It was a tire shop, Mexican guys. Mm -hmm. um, he made a deal with one of the guys, go upstairs, take care of um, one of the workers, give us money. So I, I did it. Um, Larry and I got in a fight. He would, he would hit me if I were, if I was sick and couldn't perform. Get a knock on the door. Child services at my door. They're coming to take my baby. So I had to sit there and watch these people come in and take my baby away from me. We just separate. I was staying in abandoned houses. I met this guy, he kind of sold me a dream. And then it just switched. I would have to beg for tampons. I would have to beg for a, a water. I wasn't even a person. I met a couple and I did dates with the wife. I ended up getting an infection in my leg. And um, at this point, I couldn't even move my leg. Um, I couldn't even go to the bathroom. But yeah, I was still performing dates. He was still setting up these dates. He would just kind of cover up my leg. Deep down, I'm screaming, I'm crying, I'm, I'm dead. I'm nothing inside, I am dark. There is no colors in my world. So my father comes to my house, never been there before. Didn't even know where I lived, had no clue. My brother tells him where I lived. So he comes over, doesn't even knock, just walks right in. And I mean, I've seen him get teary-eyed, but I've never seen him cry. And he's like, Jen, you're going to the hospital. Puddles of infection were just running, dripping down my leg. Emergency surgery. The infection was just on the right leg, but they had to do surgery on my left leg too, where it was just, it was just spreading. I feel like I'm taking my body back. My, my drug's not controlling my body, I'm controlling my body. So when you graduate catch, um, you become a butterfly. So that kind of represents catch, you know, the fact that I graduated. I fell in love, so that's, um, Definitely something I never thought would happen. We were friends first. He accepted my story. There is good men out there. You can find love after trauma and after everything. This is Melissa's sober living home. Hi. It's part of her final stage of recovery with Catch Court. I came in February. How long do you guys normally stay here for? There's no deadline. Okay. Um, as long as you're active and trying to, like, build your life up and continue mm -hmm. to, you know, accomplish your goals. And, I mean, this isn't where you want to be forever. Mm. But this is, like, the step before you get your own house. I mean, there's so many women that... I mean, don't know how to pay bills, don't, don't know what it is to get a money order, don't know what it is to wake their self up on their own. Mm -hmm. Like, it sounds crazy, but that's something I struggled with. Yeah. Just waking up, having that self-control to get up. There's four of us that live here. We split the bills. There's a little bit of structure, um, but really, you're fully responsible for yourself. You live in your own house, and that's pretty okay. much it. Molly, did you shut these off? No. Are you sure? When you blow dried your hair? I took out the strainer, but I plugged it back up. You have to hold it down. They are both was shut off. Why you Ouch. Never mind, they're already hot again. <laughs> Melissa has become a devout Christian no, like her housemates. Okay, it's 9.38. And they're all getting okay. ready to attend church together. My church family is like a main part of my foundation. You know, I'm connected through them, not just on Sunday. This is so hot out here. <laughs> I'm just grateful to be able to know what it's like to pay a bill to know what it's like to get a paycheck, even though sometimes it's like, dang, man, I got worked all week, and that's, and that's it. But then instead of that's it, like, you know, like, I'm a responsible, strong, independent woman today, and, and um, a productive member of society, which I never thought that I could be. 
I'll be driving in my car and I'll just start crying, like, thank you, God. I can say today I know what it's like to have a good man, to be treated right. We are spiritually connected. With or without anybody, I still love me. Some days are emotional, you know, these feelings still come up, even things that you work through, they still come up. But God has placed all the people in my life that when I can't lift myself up, I have so many people around me. I have a foundation, a firm foundation, and that's what it takes, that's what you need mm -hmm. to be able to continue to succeed in life. For anyone who's gone through catch court, Tonight is a celebration of their strength and resilience. 900 are attending from Columbus alone. These survivors have conquered the darkest of odds and it's hard not to feel the optimism and hope now shaping their future. Hi friend, how are you? I haven't seen you forever, I love your face. Slowly, old definitions of sex trafficking are crumbling under high profile cases. There's still a long way to go in prevention and convictions, but in recognizing and treating survivors, there's movement in the right direction, and Ohio is paving the way.